five. The Tories have not done nearly enough in this budget to move the political dial. Four. We do have growth. Well, we don't have any growth, actually. I was going to say we have a growth problem in the UK. We just don't have any growth. <laughs> Three. That speech was too little, too late, too timid, too rishy. One is more vaguely compass mentis than the other. That's what most people say about Planet Normal. Who's Biden and can I be Trump? <laughs> One. We have left Welcome once again to Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast with Alison Pearson. Hello. And me, Liam Halligan. So gorgeous George Galloway prevailed in the Rochdale by-election. He told Planet Normal he was odds on favourite to win and win he did. The victory of the former Labour firebrand turned pro-Palestine campaigner in the Greater Manchester constituency provoked nothing less than a speech on the steps of Number 10 by Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, warning about the dangers of a divided society. You thought that speech wasn't too bad, Alison, but you remain alarmed at Galloway's victory, and particularly the high share of postal votes cast in Rochdale, as you wrote in Wednesday's Telegraph. The link is in the show notes to this episode. Jeremy Hunt has literally just been speaking in the House of Commons, delivering the spring budget. The Chancellor's offered up some tax cuts, or at least cuts in national insurance, but will it be enough to move the dial, increasing the Tories' election chances, given that the party remains some 20 points behind Labour in most opinion polls? Will there be time for more tax cuts ahead of the next general election? Still expected to take place, at least in my view, in October or November. And can any amount of tax cuts now save the Tories' electoral bacon? Or is the government toast? Lots to talk about, Alison, and we haven't even mentioned the resurgence of the Donald, with Trump prevailing across the US in this week's Super Tuesday primaries. It looks like a Trump v. Biden rerun, or should that be a re-stagger? A repeat of the 2020 election, now inevitable. That is, of course, unless the Democrats decide to dump the 81-year-old president to make way for someone younger. Talking about someone younger, Alison, we were all much younger back in 1995, and that was when Colin Firth's Mr Darcy stepped out of the lake wearing a wet shirt in the BBC's adaptation of Pride and Prejudice. That same shirt's just been auctioned for £25,000. Was that you, co-pilot Pearson? I know you're partial to a bit of coal, but what was more expensive, securing that ultimate piece of Firth memorabilia or importing your little Turkish delight. Diddy the cat. My finances, as you know, are <laughs> shrouded in mystery. <laughs> Almost as opaque and oblique as the machinations of Chancellor Hunt, <laughs> I must say. Slightly older listeners will probably remember that wonderful 1995 TV adaptation of Pride and Prejudice with Colin Firth as Mr. Darcy and uh, Jennifer Ely as Elizabeth Bennett and Mr. Darcy. I mean, Andrew Davis, who I know a bit, very, very brilliant, but mischievous screenplay writer and adapter, probably our greatest adapter ever of classic novels. Never a man not to uh, squeeze a sex scene. You only like him because he's Welsh. (laughs) I don't like him because he's Welsh. But he really spiced up somewhat controversially Pride and Prejudice. And there was, the, of course, the iconic scene where Mr. Darcy, feeling very hot after a long gallop on his stallion, dove into the lake at Pemberley and emerged in his clinging wet white linen shirt. And indeed, the white linen shirt has, as you say, Liam, just uh, just come up for auction. It was, I think it was rumoured to reach £10,000, but went for a staggering $25,000. I was very disappointed to discover that Colin Firth wouldn't be actually going with the shirt, in which case I would have sold my house to raise the funds. But I was writing a little bit about it and I was reminded because by chance when Darcy mania was at its height in 1995, I was invited to a dinner and I found myself sitting next to Mr. Darcy himself, which was quite something. And of course, Colin Firth is a, such a nice chap, really. I mean, very, very modest and very wry. And I asked him how he was reacting to his new career as a sex symbol. Yeah. Um, 
And he said that he had an aunt. I think she was called Lucy Liam. So Aunt Lucy, who was a great Jane Austenite, and they're often a with- name close to my heart. Yes, indeed, Aunt Lucy, a, a great Jane Austenite, and they can be a very steely bunch. And and Colin said to her, Aunt Lucy, I've been cast as Mister Darcy in in the new TV adaptation of Pride and Prejudice, and she said, Don't be ridiculous, Colin. Mister Darcy is an extremely attractive and handsome man. <laughs> I could not have loved Colin Firth more at that moment. I thought to actually undermine your own pin upness, which was brilliant. I've got two things to say, Alison. The first thing, of course, is that Lucy's right because her name is Lucy. The second thing to say is that we're meant to be Planet Normal, and here you are wanging on at the top about your literary mates and and screenplay people and all, all the rest of it. But I just don't understand. you got such good taste in men. Himself indoors at Pearson Towers, somebody who I know and really admire, is a fantastic, attractive man. What is it about Colin Firth? I just don't understand. He looks like the manager of a regional branch of Watst. <laughs> I think you're the wrong gender, love, to be brutally honest. I think that's not a view widely held amongst the lady folk, I should say. But anyway, he's absolutely delightful and was a rather wonderful Mr. Darcy. But before we plough into the entrails of the Rochdale saga, I thought that you're you're always telling me, co-pilot, that I am exaggerating how bad the outlook is for the Conservatives at the forthcoming general election. But this week we had an Ipsos Mori poll which put the Tories on their lowest vote share since Ipsos Mori's political monitor began, probably back in 1821 or something. Now, listen to this. Hang on to your hats. With projections suggesting this could leave the party with just 25 seats. So my 88 is starting to look positively generous. Now, we should say, Liam, shouldn't we, that this is just one of many polls and could be wildly out. But it does really sort of raise the issue which you've kicked about a bit about whether a spring election would be wise or do they hang on grimly hoping for an act of God into the autumn and even it to January next year, which I think is the absolute final hour, isn't it? January 2025. That's it, the end of January. First thing, don't set up these straw men. Don't pretend that we're massively at loggerheads over the state of the Tory party so then you can pretend that you you were cleverer than me when it turns out the way we both think it's going to turn out. I know your ways. I know your ways. You said they can't possibly lose that many seats. You've definitely said I have not said that. You have. What I have said, God, this is so familiar. We should record (laughs) our conversations. Oh, we do. I'm going to go back. Oh, we do. Yes, we do. So- what I've said, and I'll say it again, and many Planet Normal listeners will back me up on this, get your emails in. What I've said is that things can change quickly because of the economy. That's what I've said. So much of this depends on the economy. So much of it is tied up with the economic feel-good factor and whether or not there is one. I wrote in the Telegraph last weekend that the multiple cuts in interest rates before the autumn, which the Tories have been banking on, relying on, which they want to combine with multiple tax cuts before that an autumn election, those interest rate cuts, they may not happen. They may not happen for all kinds of geopolitical reasons. Under cover of budget today, some big providers put their mortgage rates up, Alison, even though they've been coming down for months and months and months because the guilt market, financial markets, traders no longer buy into this multiple rate cuts this year outlook. Why? Because oil prices are up, because geopolitical risk is up, because there are signs of more inflation in the supply chain. Don't shoot the messenger. I don't want it to happen. I didn't think it would happen. But in the last few weeks, the facts have changed. And as John Maynard Keynes says, when the facts change, you change your mind. But look, we're going to come on to the budget. We've got a wonderful budget guest. We've got the return of somebody who proved to be incredibly popular when she first appeared on Planet Normal back in the day. But before that, we do need to talk about George Galloway. We couldn't really talk about the by-election last week because it was actually happening as Planet Normal was released. And the electoral law rightly means that we couldn't talk about it because voters were literally voting at the polls. But it's obviously something we've watched very, very closely. Planet Normal secured pretty much the only extended pre-by-election interview with George Galloway 
I thought it was a fantastic bit of journalism that we asked him on, not least because you've been so vehemently opposed to him. And just as you were kind about him, Alison, off the back of that interview a couple of weeks ago, you know, he has been kind about the way we treated him and the exchange of views that we had. So for my mind, that's good journalism. People disagreeing vehemently, but with respect. I was proud that we did that on Planet Normal. Some people have questioned whether or not we should have put him on Planet Normal, but you know, the guy's been elected, right? This is a free country. He hasn't broken any electoral laws that we know of, and he won fair and square. But that really disturbed a lot of people. And in particular, Alison, as you wrote, link in the show notes to this episode, you wrote powerfully, the Prime Minister felt that he needed to give a speech on the steps of Downing Street last Friday evening. Yeah, I think that very belatedly, Rishi Sunak sort of bolted out into Downing Street, didn't he, Liam, to warn about the Galloway victory and describing him as, you know, someone who had expressed sympathy for Hezbollah and uh, saying that the Rochdale result threatened national unity. There are many aspects to tease out here. Galloway decided to turn it into a referendum on Gaza. So you had this extraordinary spectacle of a very, very downtrodden Lancashire mill town becoming a referendum on sort of whether you were pro-Palestine or pro-Israeli. I did think it was terribly significant also because obviously Azar Aziz, the Labour candidate who had expressed was going to be the Labour candidate and indeed appeared on the ballot as the Labour candidate, but he was disowned by Keir Starmer because he had expressed anti-Semitic remarks at a meeting of Lancashire Labour. And I, and I have it on very good authority, Liam, that Mr. Aziz is, as somebody very senior in Labour described to me, he's not one of the nutters. So this actually rather moderate Muslim candidate, a good friend to many Jewish MPs. But in second place, Liam, I think was a denizen of Planet Normal. Denizen. I love that word, denizen. You know, that was an F. Scott Fitzgerald word. If we're going to be all poncy literary, all look at look look at me and my education. Yeah. It was <laughs> <laughs> Denizen. One of the villains in um uh, The Great Gatsby was a denizen of Wall Street, said uh, anyway, carry on. So step forward, vehicle repair shop owner, David Tully. And Mr. Tully seemed a very lovely, genuine bloke who had decided controversially to speak up for the concerns of Rochdale rather than the West Bank. Lovely local guy. And uh, it's interesting, Liam, to see as the independent candidate, he got 6,638 votes. And that was more than the Conservative and Labour vote combined. Unbelievable. Which I think tells you that there is a hunger bear for change. One of my many concerns about the Galloway victory was, you know, how can you even begin to say this? A lot of these northern towns, the piece I've written in The Telegraph this week, I guess it's quite a controversial piece. It's about the segregation, largely segregation of Muslim women and girls in some of these northern towns, also towns in the Midlands and in parts of East London. It's something I've been worried about for many, many years. In my column, I said that there didn't seem to be any plan by the Electoral Commission to investigate this remarkable surge in postal votes. And and we did, just before we started recording, got an email from Connor at the Electoral Commission, and he said, with regards to us not investigating the Rochdale by-election, no concerns have been raised by the returning officer or the police about the result. And he says that any evidence of electoral fraud should be reported directly and without delay to the police. So that's interesting to me, Liam. No one has raised questions about the astonishing surge in postal votes, which I think many people would think was odd, if not suspicious. And the Electoral Commission adds, to clarify, Alison, around your comments on the postal votes received by the Workers' Party of Britain, it's not possible to calculate the percentage of postal votes for each candidate because postal votes are mixed with those from polling stations before they are counted. So we have no way of knowing how many of George Galloway's votes were postal votes or were on the ballot. But I just want to say, Liam, some other things that really bothered me, there were no women on the ballot paper. 
And as far as I could see, there were no women's faces, or hardly any women's faces, among the many Muslim brothers flocking around George Galloway. And for me, sadly and very worryingly, the election was really about the increasing dominance of an of Islamist patriarchy, segregationist, in effect, who rule some towns, some of our towns in the north and the Midlands, uh, astonishingly like a tribal clan of fiefdom in Pakistan. And I did write in my column this week about a Muslim woman I came across who was born in one of those towns and has been living a double life, being a British woman as much as she can, uh, but that's wildly disapproved of by her family. Her mother has lived in the UK for 60 years, came across for an arranged marriage when she was 14 years old, still doesn't speak English and is basically locked up in the house. And I would say to you, Liam, that that is not untypical and that there is a much, much more worrying issue going on here about oppression of women, which is ignored by the Labour Party, which is very keen on telling us, isn't it, about equality and exclusion and sexism and feminism, except when it comes to the treatment of some of the women surrounding its own most passionate voters and also the Conservative Party, which must know uh, Rishi Sunak look like a panicked man. They must know this is a huge issue. The rising Islamist threat against our democracy displays of horrible, horrible slogans on our streets. But the Tory party has no answers to this huge problem. And even if it had the answers, it doesn't have the stomach to enact the measures that would be necessary to make it better. Your column about Rochdale, which I did think is very powerful, and I think it's right that we're talking about it before we move on to the budget, which we will, also contained a couple of policy recommendations that I wanted to comment on just very briefly. I agree with you, Alison. I mean, I'm really concerned that you can vote by post at all. Now, there will be people who, for very good reasons, can't make it to a polling station, people with disabilities, people who happen to be overseas on business or for whatever reason. But there should be quite a detailed process that allows you to vote by post. It shouldn't be the norm by any means because, of course, the way our system works is that you ordinarily vote in the privacy of a polling booth in person, having had your ID clarified. And that's right. That's how it should be. And if there are people who want to vote that haven't got ID, then we should furnish them with ID in good time. Because when people vote remotely by post, of course, their vote can be manipulated. Someone can take their ballot paper off them. And and I'm not saying that that's how George Galloway became an MP yet again. I'm not saying that at all because I don't know and we don't know and neither of us are claiming that. But we do worry about the danger for votes being manipulated, particularly where there are people entitled to the vote in the UK who don't have basic language skills and perhaps live in social circumstances where their free will is less easily expressed than our cultural norms would dictate. And the other sentence or two in your column that I wanted to pick out, because it really jumped off the page, and I think it it speaks well of you, is that before you were the fire-breathing columnist that you now are, not only did you come up through newspapers via sub-editing and selling advertising and all, and all the rest of it, but before that, you were a teacher and you did a lot of voluntary teaching of English as a foreign language in, in difficult parts of the country. And you've got experience of this. And I think you're right when you say, if we encourage people to learn English, there will be Brits who come out of the woodwork and volunteer to teach them. I, I absolutely agree with you that there would be an army of of young people and older people, not people at the peak of their career, but young people and older people or people who may be taking a break from work for whatever reason, who would willingly volunteer to teach English as a foreign language to people living in the UK, British citizens who need that help. I think that would be a wonderful thing. And I think there is more than a seam of goodwill in the UK to welcome people to this country and help them with their language skills in order for them to have a better experience in this country in order for them to be more active and more 
realistic, if you like, citizens of this country and the democracy that's so important to all of us. So the reality is, for all George Galloway's astonishing rhetorical firepower, which we both acknowledged, he is a lone voice in Parliament. I don't think he's going to upend Parliament. He's not going to stand for re-election. Uh, we know that because he told us that on that Planet Normal interview, and it was reported in The Telegraph. So it's not as if he's going to be around for a long time. I do think he'll make one or two speeches which really will capture national, indeed international attention in the House of Commons. I understand why the Prime Minister felt that he had to make the speech that he did after George Galloway was elected. But I don't, again, for one second, apologise that we interviewed him here on Planet Normal. The Telegraph ran that interview and then we commented, not in entirely negative terms, off the back of his interview. I think that was good journalism. I think what really frustrated me and what one reason why Rishi Sunak is absolutely bumping along now rock bottom poll ratings was that speech was too little, too late, yeah. too timid, too Rishi. And the things he was talking about, Liam, about these flagrant displays of, of anti-Semitism and hateful slogans being projected onto parliament, council meetings being disrupted, MPs being threatened. Well, there was someone called Suella Braverman who warned Rishi Sunak in November that the police needed to take a harder line against the Islamists and people who hated our way of life. So Rishi Sunak really has a bit of a cheek because four months ago, Liam, he sacked Suella Braverman, who was warning in no uncertain terms about the very threats that Rishi Sunak suddenly discovered and spoke about in his speech. And when he had suddenly been warning Metropolitan Police officers that mob rule was breaking out in Britain, which is a point that Suella had been making for some time. So I think that what we're looking at now is that absolutely Conservative Party praying it will blow over. And unbelievably, Liam, the solution that they're coming up with to this really, I would say, very, very dangerous, explosive situation is to come up with a new definition of extremism. I mean, that, that, that will sort it out, won't it? And what we know, of course, as Miriam Cates MP, one of my favourite MPs, has just pointed out, the kind of views that Miriam and indeed I and, and, and J.K. Rowling and many, many women hold about biological sex and uh, women having their own spaces, they could easily, under this new definition of extremism, <laughs> be called extreme when they're held by, I would think, the vast majority of women and, and almost certainly men in the country. So really, the issue, as we talked about, is Enabling women, Muslim women, 70% of Muslim women are not in employment, Liam. And that is, I would say that was for me the key factor in preventing integration, meaningful integration, Muslim women feeling more British, making British friends, motherhood. Mothers, Liam, are the great driver of integration. They want their kids to succeed. They want them to fit in and be like the other children. And it is, I would say, it was male patriarchy and oppression, which is keeping those women away and is causing the festering conditions where we see hatred of our own country in our own towns. And it has to stop. Just before we move on, I did just want to briefly mention the U.S., presidential election, which will happen in November 2024. I think it's almost certain the UK election will happen this year. I can't see it going to January, a uh, depths of winter election. I do think the UK election will be either in October or November. This is the first time since the 60s, since 1964, that a US and UK election have happened in the same year. That was the height of the Cold War, of course, following the assassination of JFK. And, and we've got to just mark this because, of course, the US election is so important. We've had Super Tuesday. Uh, we've had Trump pretty much winning all the primaries. OK, he lost Washington, D.C. to Nikki Haley, but Washington Republicans hate him. A lot of Republicans would say Washington Republicans are basically Democrats anyway. Nikki Haley on Wednesday, the day of recording, has signaled that she's actually dropping out now of the primaries, but she's not going to endorse Trump. And on the other side of the aisle, if you like, across the US Congress, the Democrats have had a bit of a blow because Michelle Obama, who was the kind of great hope 
as somebody who could replace Biden as he becomes ever more doddery, she's also ruled herself out of running. Whether or not she's doing that to play hard to get because she's negotiating with the Democrat establishment, I don't know. But there's certainly a lot of people who call themselves progressives in the US will be deeply disappointed that the former President Barack Obama's wife, who is an incredibly impressive, highly educated, extremely articulate woman. I mean, people, wherever you come, your politics, you, you just got to acknowledge that. She's a really significant person in US public life. She is now on current statements, not going to be running in that election. So it will be Trump probably versus Biden and Trump could win. And uh, the world has to prepare itself for that, including a lot of our own sort of liberal media and political establishment who would be horrified by that prospect. Uh, And even though Trump could win, there's a rise in the threats of so-called lawfare, isn't it? A a phrase that, that you've used. It may be that Trump wins and then there is talk that the Democrats, if they control the Senate, use some kind of legalistic maneuver to oust him from the White House, even after he's won. Every legal trick in the book that they've thrown at him, I'm not I'm not saying there aren't some charges against him which don't merit airing, certainly encouraging people to march on the Capitol. There's definitely something to answer there. But some of these sort of spurious, really drummed up things against him, every time the Democrats try to do it, it emboldens and it uses his base. So that's what we've got. And it, and it's the most polarized America now. I mean, I think we are sadly, Liam, heading that way. But America is so deeply polarized. And I was personally disappointed because I thought Nikki Haley was an extremely plausible, highly intelligent candidate. She's 51. She was the governor of South Carolina, very, very popular Republican governor. Uh, She was US ambassador to the United Nations. She's been the first woman to win a Republican presidential primary. It seems to be quite astonishing, you know, whatever your politics, that in 2024, Nikki Haley is the first woman to win a Republican presidential primary. I mean, sometimes the, the United States, the greatest democracy on earth, it just seems to be so far behind Europe in its ability to find a woman leader. I mean, you know, will there, will there even, Liam, in our lifetime be a female president of the United States? It just seems to me very sad. And I, you know, Biden or Trump, you know, God knows who on earth would want to pick between those two. I mean, as you say, I mean, one is sort of vaguely more compass than the other. But, you know, I mean, really, it's a, what's that word? I can't pronounce it. Gerontocracy. It's a, it's two old men, one barely able to remember his own name, or certainly not able to remember his own wife, name. Um, Absolutely ridiculous. It's ridiculous that the Democrats should be running Joe Biden as a candidate. I mean, he, you know, he's he's bad enough now. What will he be like in four or five years time? Someone like that should not be in charge of the most powerful nation on earth and particularly not at a time when we see these global threats. I mean, Putin must be absolutely laughing, mustn't he, at this? One is more vaguely compass mentis than the other. That's what most people say about Planet Normal. <laughs> <laughs> Who's Biden and can I be Trump? <laughs> Helen Thomas is the co-founder and CEO of Blonde Money, a financial consultancy that takes its name from her striking mane of blonde hair. Hailing from Blackpool via Christchurch College, Oxford, she has over 20 years of experience in banking, fund management and politics. A former Treasury advisor, Helen holds a CFA qualification, having aced those notoriously difficult chartered financial analyst exams. And after a stint as a currency trader, she set up Blonde Money to bridge the often yawning lack of understanding between the wacky worlds of politics and financial markets. Helen Thomas, Great to have you back on Planet Nor. Helen, I viewed this budget as pretty unambitious, pretty low key. You're steeped not just in economics and business and finance, but in politics too. Did this feel like a pre election budget to you? Well, it's a pre election budget with this ghostly figure that haunted in the entire proceedings, which is the OBR, this body <laughs> of 
learned uh, allegedly. Well, they're, they're pretty good economists, to be fair. But, you know, their forecasts are the absolute truth, as it were, that they have to do everything around. So it, it was just like it was stalking through every single line of what was going on is how I felt about it. So it was, it was kind of as bold as you could be if you want to operate within the constraints of the OBR. Which adds up to not very bold. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, not not really. Although I, I, I did, I did pull together, you know, some strands of a vague theme. Can I just say, sorry, before I get into the nuts and bolts, did you think that the delivery was a bit flat? I did, but the Chancellor did run 17 miles on Wednesday morning, didn't he? So maybe he was uh, a bit, what we say, tired, out of puff. I would go further. I think we've been many years now looking for a cure for insomnia, but... Jeremy Hunt, finally, what's not to like? You're asleep within seconds, aren't you? Well, it's, I think, you know, going back to your point, Liam, about it being, it is a big pre-election one. And I know it feels like they want it to be the penultimate one. Yeah. And we can maybe come back to why that might not be the case, actually. Okay. But uh, it feels like they're taking this very long running jump up to the electorate because there's such a massive gap they've got to actually hurdle over. I'm mixing all my metaphors there. But maybe he didn't think he had to be that bold, but... I mean, given the polling, well, you can't really believe that, can you, to be honest? Can I ask both of you? So in the autumn statement back in November, Jeremy Hunt cut 2P on national insurance, and that seemed to have barely registered on the public or on the polls at all. So now he's cut another 2P on national insurance. Do you think the public would have preferred him to cut income tax? And could he not do that bolder, more ambitious thing because he was worried about the OBR and whether he could afford it? So clearly there was this big debate about income tax versus the NI cut. It is more expensive to do income tax, but you're right to pick up there on the OBR element of this because, you know, income tax arguably is more inflationary and then that you know screws up the sums further down the line because this is an economy we're talking about and there's so many interacting factors but to go to the heart of your question of what the voters think well personally I actually think if you're going to cut taxes income tax is the totemic one that grabs people then you get into, did people want to cut taxes at all? And there's obviously been mixed polling on that, where a lot of voters are concerned about can't get a doctor's appointment, worried about what's happening in schools, worried about the Middle East, loads of other things. General cost of living, of course, is still is still so high. I saw some polling. The one I really picked up on, actually, I've seen recently, was when they asked female voters from 2019, what would they like to see? What's the number one policy they'd like to see? They said they wanted lower interest rates. And then that's a real pickle because the government don't do that bit. That's the Bank of England. So the whole economic response to all of of this, I might add, actually, that I'm very glad you guys are discussing this on your podcast. And I really hope people's eyes are not glazing over because there's big, big, important economic questions. And we're not even doing that. We're, We're having to dance around tiny little tweaks here and there because of what happened in that infamous budget of 2022. It's like it's like we're all hiding behind the real discussion because, you know, because we don't want to freak out the financial markets. Yes, exactly. And there's some sympathy with that. I mean, I don't know if you want us to rehash and revisit that moment, although it is important and we should at some stage, maybe on a later podcast. But, you know, there's a large element of what happened in that budget period that was to do with the lack of regulation of the LDI pension funds. And indeed, the Bank of England introducing lots of new bonds to yep. the market yes. under a policy called quantitative tightening and, and now the nation's eyes are glazing over these are yeah. very very complex issues well, but Lynn, they are and what, but what you've just said that very key thing you've just said is why we didn't get an income tax cut today exactly and so it is so important sorry for the person on the clapham uber <laughs> uh, can you, <laughs> helen can you just explain that because because it was too risky they were frightened if they cut income tax they'd spook the markets is that right so part of this is the narrative of what actually happened in that autumn budget. Mm. Well, of course, it was a crisis. The Bank of England had to step in and stabilise things. That, that's never good. So there was obviously a crisis. Now, what caused it? Various elements. But part of it was the the process of how that budget was delivered in that they threw the OBR forecasts away. Now, that's just one part. But what everyone has latched onto since then is, oh, goodness, well, you can't do oh, That's what did it. The, OB, the OBR weren't consulted. They didn't give us their amazing... Mm numbers, even though they're not the world's most reliable forecasters. I mean, no one is, of course, we can't predict the economy. But what I want to drill into here is 
that this fear over the financial market is making the government obsess about decimal places on an economy that is trillions of pounds in size and which has racked up 400 billion pounds of debt. So it's it's almost like, what do they say, tragedy rewritten as farce? Yeah. It's sort of taking a lesson and then taking it to the nth degree and flogging it like a dead horse. So because an income tax cut approximately cut, a one pence cut in income tax would be, now Liam, you can tell me if I've got the number. Seven cut. billion. Seven billion. And a 1% cut in NIC is five billion. Exactly. So there's not much in it, really, but there is a lot in it if you're worrying about literally getting down to the decimal point of, and this is the key number, this is the key number, debt falling as a percentage of GDP in five years' time. And that was the one thing that he wanted to make sure with the OVR forecast was the case. On such things, is policy made? I think that's exactly right and well put. So the Liz Truss mini budget is very convenient for the Labour Party and indeed, you know, much of the Conservative Party to say that Liz Truss wrecked the economy. Future historians will say that, yes, but, because just a few days before that ill-fated mini budget, even though it was badly sold, even though I think the former prime minister and her chancellor were high-handed, and I've said that to both of them to their face several times. The Bank of England was unwinding quantitative easing. So the Bank of England was selling lots and lots of government debt into the market just at the time when they knew this budget was going to involve a lot more borrowing and a lot more debt being sold into the market. And that's why the price of that debt fell. That's why the yield on that debt, the interest rate that impacts all of us, people trying to get mortgages, people with personal loans, spiked as much as it did. But, you know, under Hunt and Sunak, the same interest rates in financial markets have spent quite a lot of time above where they were at the peak of the mini budget crisis. So there's a lot going on here and it's extremely difficult for people, unlike Helen, who's obviously very expert in this area, to follow. And I think there has been a big row between the OBR and the Treasury and that row has been contained because there's been a compromise Hunt wanted a big headline number cut. He wanted a 2% cut of something rather than a 1% cut of something. And so they went for NIC. They went for national insurance contributions reductions because they're cheaper, because pensioners pay income tax, landlords pay income tax, but they don't pay national insurance. So a national insurance cut only affects people who, you know, their income is from paid work. Also, something that's very rarely mentioned, but I know for a fact this is part of the Treasury's thinking. An NIC cut applies in Scotland. An income tax cut by the Tories doesn't apply in Scotland because it's the government of Scotland who award income tax cuts. That's another point that I think is worth making. But in general, the tax burden, as far as I can see, and I'm still drilling through the numbers, and if I'm wrong about this, I apologize to the Treasury and I'll correct it in my later writing and commentary. It strikes me that the overall tax burden is still rising because the headline cut in national insurance, the freeze of fuel duty, the freeze of alcohol duty, the very meagre raising of the threshold on VAT from 85 to 90 grand. That's the first rise in that VAT threshold for seven years. More than offset by the increase in tax, the increase in the tax burden that's happening, winding up because tax thresholds are frozen until 2028. So as your wages go up, as the prices go up, People are dragged into higher tax brackets, the ultimate stealth tax. That was the big offstage aspect of this budget. The tax threshold stayed where they were and fiscal drag will continue. People will continue to feel worse off. And I accept that a lot of people tell pollsters that they care more about you know government spending than they do about tax cuts. But I bet, Helen, you are a longstanding student of politics. You know you, you've forgotten more about conservative politics than I'll ever know. But you will remember, as will Alison, that 92 election, the spiral of silence when John Major won. Pollsters tell people, of course we want higher taxes, of course we want more money for the NHS, and they go into that voting booth and they think about themselves and their family and they vote for lower taxes. The Tories have not done nearly enough in this budget to move the political dial, in my view, and I agree with you, Helen, they have been massively constrained by an Office for Budget Responsibility that's now convinced itself that it runs Britain rather than the elected politicians. Before we move on, Helen and, and Liam, on Planet Normal, Helen, 
we have a healthy skepticism about modeling, having seen the COVID lockdown modeling coming wildly adrift. Now, I noticed that another, uh, not quite as good as Copilot Halligan, but also very good economist, Sky News' Ed Conway, I picked up this. Very good journalist. He said the average OBR forecasting error for the national debt five years hence is 415 billion pounds, <laughs> yet the decisions in the budget will be based on those forecasts. I mean, I, I know we should be, we, we've been talking about this quite a lot, but this seems to be absolutely extraordinary that there are all sorts of areas. I mean, personally, I was hoping with, with kids in their 20s for the chance to do something, you know, for first-time house buyers and so on. There were all sorts of things that people were, I think, crying out for. And yet the government seems to have its hands tied. I mean, it is a problem, isn't it? Well, politics is about winning the argument and you normally get a mandate by going to the country and then you win an election and you can do things and the problem for the conservative party is that the last two prime ministers weren't elected by the country they were barely elected by well the last one wasn't even elected by his own mps because it um it just it all you know he just got into position didn't he in the end so that's a problem when you're trying to prosecute an argument and convince people that you know best when you haven't even put that to the voters. So I think that you know, they're, they're being constrained because they haven't won that support. So, so they have to be, you know, they're tiptoeing around. So much of the Tories' electoral chances now depend on the decisions of faceless, unelected bureaucrats, not just at the OBR, but also at the Bank of England. The centrepiece of the Conservatives' election strategy, to the extent they have one, is to try and get a succession of tax cuts in before the election. We had one in January. It didn't register because it's only been in one pay packet so far. That's why it hasn't registered. And they've got another one coming in in May, and they want to do another tax cut in an autumn statement in September, just before the party conference, it seems to me. But also, they're relying even more on the Bank of England lowering interest rates and this is a central point, and I know Helen watches this very, very closely given her expertise in financial markets. Financial markets don't now believe that multiple rate cut by the autumn scenario that the Tories are relying on, or at least they believe in it a lot less than they did. The yield on the 10-year government a gilt, i.e. how much the government has to pay to borrow money for 10 years, has risen quite sharply in the last month or two, as oil prices have risen, as geopolitics has become more tense, not just in the Red Sea with the Houthi rebels, you know, but also Russia, Ukraine, and the death of you know Navalny, a, a much revered, certainly in the West, leader of the opposition in Russia. All these things are cranking up the geopolitical tension. All these things are spooking financial markets. All these things are leading to forecasts of higher energy prices on wholesale markets, which will feed into inflation, which will mean that governments have to pay more on their debt. There'll be less scope for them to lower taxes because their debt service costs will go up so much. And Helen, what do you think of this? Because this really is the crucial thing in politics at the moment. Not, you know, should Keir Starmer lose weight, as Peter Mandelson said. Not, you know, is Rishi's wife a non-dormant what does that mean for her personal finances? Should he publish his tax return? All this stuff is tittle-tattle. What really matters is, are we going to see a succession of interest rate cuts generating some kind of feel-good factor so the Tories can make a fist of challenging Labour? You're right. That is the key question. And it's like the government's become almost like the hedge funds that I talk to. They're sort of punting everything on, uh, on they've made a bet here that, yep. you know, interest rates are going to fall. Yep. And, you know, as anyone in markets will tell you, yeah, sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. Uh, it doesn't always pan out like that. You have just outlined all the reasons why inflation is likely to actually remain quite sticky. Uh, we do have growth. Well, we don't have any growth, actually. I was going to say about a growth problem in the UK. We just don't have any growth. <laughs> so the thing is that, well, you look at the Bank of England, the, the most recent meeting, it was a couple wanted to raise rates. The majority kept the same. One wanted to cut. They don't know. No. I mean, it is tricky because we're almost, I hate to use the word stagflation, but it is a bit like that. And that's quite hard with interest rates. So I think putting, as any good trade will tell you, putting all your eggs into one basket on one trade 
well, I mean, if it works, you look like an absolute genius, but the chance of getting wiped out is, is pretty high. And I think that's uh, actually where the government's going with, uh, with expecting that from the UK interest rate curve. Helen Thomas, Mrs. Blonde Money herself. Great to have you on Planet Normal again. You're always welcome. Thank you. Now on to our listener emails. Your messages sent to planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. Please keep them coming. We love to read your thoughts. The citizens of Planet Normal. Liam, we've had a lot of reaction to the Rochdale by-election and what I wrote about in my column about the women living in very segregated societies within our country, British girls who don't enjoy the benefit of the freedoms that British girls and women should enjoy. And Wendy's email caught my eye. Uh, Wendy says, the vast majority of Asian girls up north where we live are subject to, in effect, arranged marriages, many to men living in Pakistan who often do not speak English. They are then able to apply for British citizenship after five years. Alison, if you want to have an inkling of the lives of Pakistani women in Leeds in this case, do watch the Push documentary on Channel 4, a woman who was murdered, Liam Fauziha, she was a solicitor with a fully engaged mother, fluent in English, who wanted the best for her daughter. It wasn't an arranged marriage. Parents gave Fauziha the right to choose her own husband, Rashid. Despite this, in the documentary, her father says quite openly to the camera, in our culture, the girl always goes to the boy's side of the family. Before the wedding, Fauziha's mother told Rashid's parents that her daughter wasn't going to be doing housework and cooking all day because she was a career woman and she was a talented lawyer. And it was on that basis that this young woman went to live with her husband's parents, that it was clear, soon clear, what the expectations of an Asian bride are to this day in our country, in a culture of second and even third generation Muslims. And that marriage quickly hit trouble. And there were recorded phone calls, which you can see in this Channel 4 documentary, The Push, with her husband, Rashid, and Fauziha said, do I have no say in how I want my life with you? And Rashid replied, no, you can't. With what? With what? Because you're married now. Who do you think you are? You're not a man. Start behaving like a woman. Don't be a British woman. I'm telling you now that it's not going to work. You're coming back tomorrow because that's what I've told you to do. And Wendy adds women being subjugated into this culture where the men still rule supreme, women are subservient. It is accepted that a married girl, no matter how talented or educated, goes to live as a housemaid for their husband's families. I despair. Me too, Wendy. Very powerful stuff. This is from Victoria, who is a loyal Planet Normal listener, in her own words. Ray. Dear Liam and Alison, the lunatics have officially overtaken the asylum. I was utterly incredulous to read that some Russell Group universities now believe in the name of discrimination and at a time when the economy is tanking, cost of living and taxation are at record highs, productivity is too low and stagnant, that saying the most qualified person should get the job is a microaggression. God forbid that someone who knows what they're doing and has been trained to do it is the right person for the job. Do business not have enough to contend with as it is? I started my own consultancy, says Victoria, in 2000. I funded my own maternity leave. I thought I was brilliantly clever to have twins. (laughs) So only one maternity leave until, like all other twins' mums, I discovered that childcare for twin babies and toddlers wipes out all your salary. And for some of my friends, it actually cost more, but they needed to stay to build a career. And unlike recent governments, 20 plus years on, we are reaping the success of our sacrifices. As well as my maternity leave, my company's funded sick days, including breast cancer five years ago. I've carried the risk of no work coming in, having to build the business while delivering to bring in income. I took no furlough during COVID or other government support. My company pays corporation tax, employers national insurance, VAT, which we generously collect on behalf of HMRC. Hmm. I pay personal tax and employees national insurance. Yet HMRC seem to think that small business owners are only in business to be tax-dodging crooks or selfish capitalists. There is no recognition of what we build, the opportunities we create, the knock-on economy, sandwiches, coffees, the jobs we create. Many of my contemporaries have chucked it in and retired. I don't blame them. I love what I do, Alison and Liam, and I'm good at it. I don't want to stop yet. 
but any more regulations and or taxation and the pendulum will swing far enough for me to go and the economy will lose another small business that could have continued for several more years yet. If any Conservative MPs are listening, oh yes they are, Victoria, believe me. (laughs) If any Conservative MPs are listening to this, and by golly they should be, they need to realise I represent the silent majority. There are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of small business owners like me. Brackets, Velma can do the research. That's you, Alison. (laughs) The Reform Party get it. Put personal tax thresholds up and we'll take more money out of our businesses and pump the economy, painters, decorators, new washing machines, gardeners, cleaners, even shoes and handbags. Everyone in the silent majority needs to know they are not alone. And that's the brilliance of Planet Normal. It really is an island of common sense in a sea of madness. Kind regards, Victoria. That's a wonderful email, Victoria. Thank you so much. Absolutely wonderful. Great snapshot of a woman and a business person's life. I just want to say, Liam, we've had some absolutely brilliant news stories really submitted recently by Planet Normal listeners, and they've been making headlines in the Daily Telegraph, even making the front page of the Daily Telegraph. So please do keep those coming if you've got anything that you know about which you think deserves wider exposure. We're really happy to put our top reporters and editors onto it. And talking of which, this is from Charlotte. Now, Charlotte has written to us before. Charlotte is very much not her real name, but this is another great email. Dear Planet Normal, Charlotte here again. For the first time in my career over 25 years, I witnessed a conversation between a healthcare professional and someone from the med tech industry where environmental concerns were put ahead of patient welfare. The healthcare professional agreed the product would improve patient safety and comfort for a group of their patients, but could not use the product because it contained more plastic than the current product. The healthcare professional admitted that they have been forced to change several products to achieve the NHS's net zero target. Every part of the NHS is under-resourced and waiting lists remain historically high, but commitment to green zealotry remains unchanged. I have attached the document, says Charlotte, that is driving this madness. The amount of resources dedicated to the green agenda within the NHS is astounding and the fact that it is now impacting clinical decision-making is, I believe, grossly unethical. Kind regards, Charlotte. That's an astonishing story, Liam, which our news desk is now pursuing. There is a document within the NHS about meeting net zero within the NHS, and it is directly impacting the medicines, the the advances in medicines are not being passed on to patients if they contain more plastic than the older, less efficient medicine. And finally, from Maggie, I wish I could live on planet normal, says Maggie. Not only do you give me comfort in your common sense opinions and relevant discussions, but you make me laugh too. People must look at me as I'm walking along, laughing away to myself at some comment or joke that you've made. Thank you for keeping me relatively sane in a mad, mad world. And on that bombshell, that's it from Planet Normal for another week. As we leave our sanctuary of sweet reason, our flying refuge of reason views, email of the week, it's my turn. And it has to be... The small business leader, Victoria, you are the backbone of Britain. We support you. We salute your courage and indefatigability, as a politician once said. So send in your address to planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk and we will send you a rare as rocking horse poo Planet Normal mug. And should you wish to replace one Mr. Jeremy Hunt, because I believe there'll shortly be a vacancy, (laughs) Victoria... You, I'm sure you do a sterling job. If you enjoy Planet Normal, we jolly well hope you do. Please leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. The co-pilot and I often read the reviews to cheer ourselves up in these mad times. And as we speed away from our beloved Planet Normal and the madness of Planet Earth comes back into view, thanks as ever to our wonderful producers, Isabel Bajard, Cass Ho, Louisa Wells. Stay safe and in touch with us and with each other. Until next week, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him.